true about Pete Ritti, Part 2 Shaga, basking in the sun of false greatness, continued to commit one terrible crime after another. Two of his most abominable crimes led eventually to his undoing and his death at the early age of 35. One day, the beautiful royal wife Mbuzigazi found herself pregnant and reported the fact to Nandi. But it was this pregnancy which Nandi decided to overlook. She allowed Mbuzigazi to escape to a land of a distant tribe and when Shaga came to hear about this, he sent strong forces after her. Mbuzigazi nevertheless made good her escape and lived to a great old age, watching her and Shaga's son grow into a mighty warrior. On learning her escape, Shaga turned his wrath on the only woman he loved, his mother, the beautiful Nandi. He ran a spear through her thigh. He thus committed the vilest crime in Bandulo. He shed the blood of his own mother. According to our laws, such a mother is considered as having been murdered, even though she remained alive. This explains the inconsistency where Zulu historians insist that Shaga murdered his mother, while white historians insist that she was not murdered by Shaga. Both are right, of course, in a strange way. Nandi died, in fact, of diarrhea two years later, but the Zulus insist that she had been murdered in the first place by Shaga. By then, the Zulus were becoming mutinous as a result of the chief's excesses and wanton cruelty, and the first rumblings of sedition and agitation were heard. At this critical stage, Shaga committed his last crime. He sent an impi into the land of Shangan with the sole purpose of stealing cattle. But by a strange trick, the Shangana sent his impi running back to Zululand with his figurative tail between its legs. Shaga was beside himself with fury. He ordered some of his battle indunas killed. He arrested the families of his indunas and held them as hostages. The Bantu regard the holding of women and children as hostages as the lowest act of cowardice. This was his last crime. Mkabai, the aunt of Dingana and Mbopa, then decided to act. Shaga was not murdered by men thirsting for power and edged on by a deadly middle-aged female schemer. He was tried in absentia for his many wanton crimes and was justly condemned to death. If Mthangana, Dingana, and Mbopa, the three half-brothers of Shaga who executed him, had been ordinary murderers, they would have been executed for their crime that very same day. A Bantu law lays down that any assassin of a chief must be killed, regardless of any good reason he might have. This law is not applicable, however, to the killing of a chief in battle in a fair duel or in self-defense. A message had been sent discreetly to Shaga the night before, hinting that unless he mended his ways, he would be kissed on the neck by his half-brothers. Shaga ignored this with his usual cold contempt. Nye logo, nye kona, ngazalwa njena, nyoba njena njalo, ngege. I was born what I am, I am what I am, and I will be just what I am since I can never and will never change. Dingana then came into the kraal of Shaga in the late morning and found him sitting outside his great hut, surrounded by his servants and guard. Dingana greeted his half-brother who responded with the customary inclining of his haughty, handsome head. 
my brother, said Tingana, in a voice that was far from steady. We have a loin apron that we must sue with you, and you will honor us by accompanying us to the cattle enclosure outside your crawl. Shaga smiled, a hard smile, and reacted quite calmly. My brothers would like me to join them in suing a loin apron, but they had better be careful not to get their fingers injured by the awls and needles they sue with. With this veiled threat, he rose and followed them. The guards also rose to follow, but Shaga waved them back contemptuously. Stay! This is only for royal ears to hear. The place which they went was a spy a great circular kettle pen which was empty and reserved for official meetings where commoners were not allowed to be present. As they entered, Shaga sat down arrogantly even though his three half-brothers remained standing. There were several carved stools in place. They were astonished by the calm expression they read on Shaga's face and Dingana told my great-grandfather afterwards that the face of Shaga was like the face of a man who was lost in the valleys of another land, lost in spirit, far, far, far away. Mlangana then knelt before Shaga and presented him directly with a tuft made of tail feathers of the Indua bird. With a hard smile, Shaga took the tuft and contemptuously started to destroy it while waiting for his half-brothers to make the next move. Although Shaga had left his weapons behind, his three half-brothers were armed with short, broad, bladed stabbing spears of the kind that Dingiswayo had invented. And even while Shaga was pulling the tuft of feathers apart, Dingana raised his spear behind Shaga's back. He held it thus, raised for a few moments, seeking in this symbolic act the forgiveness of the spirits. And then, with teeth gritted, he plunged the spear deep into Shaga's back, just under the right shoulder blade. Shaga sprang up with a hoarse shriek as Dingana withdrew the spear and staggered a few paces with blood flowing down his back in a fountain. He fell on his side at the feet of his executioners. His face lost its look of shocked surprise, and he looked up at them with his usual contempt and arrogance. He gasped, and blood burst from his mouth as he said, So, you... Kill me, my brothers. No one answered, and Shaga smiled. His voice gathered strength as he continued. You think you kill me, so you can rule. But swallows build their nest of mud. They seize your land and rule it. All three now stabbed Shaga and licked their spears. Then they buried him in a temporary grave, wrapped in an old carros, the burial of a condemned and executed criminal, alone, unwept for, and without the ugly wounds having been cleansed of blood and dirt. White historians often go into great detail when they tell us what so-and-so did, but they never tell us who he was. His portrait stares at us from the pages of history books like a god made of unfeeding brass. In no history book will any reader find Petra Deef described as a human being, 
only as an historical figure. It seems to me that white historians are more concerned about the deeds of an historical figure than with his personality. They thereby turn him into an actor pirouetting on the stage of history. Nobody's deeds or wise words can possibly make any sense unless these are seen against the background of a particular person's personality. Bantu historians, on the other hand, always make a point of giving future generations a clear description of the character of an important personality. They will describe in great detail his features and physique, his habits, down to how he frequently coughs, smiles or swears, his likes and dislikes as far as foods are concerned, how he treats his wives, children, friends, superiors and inferiors, his courage or cowardice, his childhood and how certain incidents have contributed towards moulding his personality. Only when these circumstances are taken into consideration can a clear and unbiased conclusion be drawn from such actions or occurrences that render the particular person a figure of historical importance. The custodians of Zulu history give us a description of Pete Radif, the fourth tracker leader which I have not yet seen in any standard history book. The white man, Litevo, was an old man when he came to our land. His beard and his hair were as white as the morning frost of June, and he was not as tall as most of the other white men, but he was thick of body and powerful steel of muscle. He was a man of laughter, and there was continuously the spirit of laughter in his eyes. He always made jokes with the mighty men of Dingana, and wherever he was, the ghost of mirth was always there with him. He was a great man for practical jokes, and in pleasant ways he could make his friends look like fools. We all liked the strange one who tried his best to speak to us in the language of the Tosas, which he could speak reasonably, but with a strange accent. He was a man of happiness, and one could hear him laughing with the other white ones as they rode on their strange animals through the bush. We used to spy on the white ones as they went through our land with their wagons and their strange animals which they rode. We could hear Litivo talking and laughing with his fellows, whom he had the habit of slapping heartily on the back as he laughed. We could not understand the strange guttural language that they used, but the spirit of mirth lived in the heart of Litivo was like a living fire that reached our hearts, even at a great distance. While we lay in the long grass, spying on him and his men, while they rode to the crawl of Dingan. Thus, my great-grandfather described Petrodif to my grandfather, who in turn passed it on to me. And although this translation into English robs the words of much of their beauty, it still conveys the spirit of admiration the Zulus had for Litevu and his men. Wherever a party of four trekkers moved, they always publicized the fact that they were only an advance party and that substantial numbers of their fellows were somewhere in the background. While this was true in many cases, in others it was merely used as a bluff to discourage hostile acts by the Bantu through whose lands they moved. On many occasions, the Bantu actually learnt at a high cost of lives that little 
was to be gained from interfering with these parties of trackers, and nobody was more conscious of this fact than Dinga. Another factor that should be mentioned briefly is the fact that Dingana dearly loved the throne to which he was not entitled. Although he was in fact Shaga's executioner, his elder brother Mhlangana was the rightful successor. Dingana was, however, his aunt's favorite nephew. And this dirty, scheming, unnatural slut of a woman urged Dingana to eliminate his own brother. Mkabai was one of the most cold-blooded monsters who ever lived. She was so evil that she did not stop at encouraging her nephews to murder each other. It was her idea that since Mhlangana had a craze for bathing himself in the river, his two brothers should one day accompany him and make him take an overdose of the water. The selfish Dingana and maniac Mbopa found their aunt's command a rather attractive proposition and executed it to the letter. The Zulu people became suspicious, and with Dingana's inherent laziness and the increasingly obvious truth that it was really his evil aunt ruling them, with Dingana merely a figurehead, he could hardly be looked upon as a popular ruler. He felt his power waning and indulged in ruthless actions designed to improve the image of mastery. He sent impes on senseless raids to boost his power, even though he showed no interest in their training and rarely led them in person. As leaders, he appointed in donors whom he felt he could not trust, in the hope that they might get killed. And this was often the sole purpose of the raid. All these things added up to Dingana's developing as a monster almost as despised as Shaga at the height of his madness. The Zulus became tired of being ruled by the sons of Senzanga Kona and many were deserting the tribe to join the leper Mbande whom they hoped they could strengthen so that he could start a new dynasty. With this picture as background, how can anyone believe that Dingana arranged the killing of Bidratif and his party through sheer treachery and for no logical reason? There could have been no doubts in his mind that his action would lead to his own undoing and the undoing of the tribe he ruled, and of this he was not prepared to take the slightest chance. The two crucial questions in the Bidratif mystery which no history book has ever asked, are, firstly, why did Dingana take a decision while fully conscious of the fact that they would thereby commit both personal and national suicide? Why were Peter Thief and his followers clubbed to death with Sikongwana clubs, the kind which Zulu women use when they turn their leather skin skirts? I have explained before, that the style of execution befits the crime the condemned man has committed. Tingana was no coward, but he was too lazy and pleasure-loving to show any interest in battles of any description. And least of all, in battles involving the white fort trackers, he was, however, a meticulous schemer, and he had noticed something which other chiefs had failed to see and which he was the first leader to ever exploit. He had seen how the four trekkers loathed and despised the English, who had forced them out of the Cape. He had seen how the haughty English watched with contempt the entry of the four trekkers into Natal. Both these white factions had spoken evilly of one another in the presence of Dingan. Through his thick curtain of mud slinging, Dingana saw his opportunity. Why not rid himself of the enroaching danger merely by setting these two white factions at one another's throats? He could then simply sit back 
and watch the fun. The four trekkers came to Dingab and negotiated with him for certain land rights and he allocated to them by a treaty a piece of land in the west of Zululand, the same territory he subsequently allocated to the English. He did so on purpose, hoping that when the two enemies found themselves occupying the same land, they would go for one another like mad dogs over a juicy bone. This cannot possibly be construed as treachery on the part of Dingan. He was, in fact, being tricked out of the same piece of land by both parties, and each came to him with European-style documents which meant nothing to him. And, furthermore, each set of documents was in a different language he could not understand. He was required to give his signature, which he could not write, being illiterate in the white man's style of writing. But his dealings with the four trekkers were along more honorable lines. The four trekkers were prepared to purchase land or to offer certain services or guarantees. They asked Dingana to stipulate his price and, not being conversant with European-style transactions, he made the ceding of land conditional on effecting the return of 200 head of cattle the chief Sikonyela had stolen from his crawl a short while before. Sikonyela was not only an expert thief, but quite a wizard too. And attacking wizards with their superhuman powers is something Zulu warriors do not relish. Dingana saw Pitretif as an instrument to overcome this difficulty because these white men were less impressed by Bantu wizardry. He thought they were more immune to it. Retief took his men and off they went on the long journey to the land of Sikonyela. And in his pocket, Retief carried something that was most queer to the mind of the African, a pair of handcuffs. Already a humorous thought had entered his mind, and he was anxious to return to Zululand with an hilarious anecdote. They found thugs, villains and scoundrels trying their best to look like warriors. Retief greeted the vagabond chief and soon created an atmosphere of merriment with his strong sense of humor. Eventually, he produced the handcuffs and started impressing Sikonyela with the magical powers of these bracelets. Eager to increase his own magical powers, Sikonyela agreed to have them fitted, and dexterously Retief clicked them on his wrists, no matter how he tried. Sikonyela could not free his thieving hands. He raged and cursed luridly in his own language, provoking only louder peals of laughter from his white visitors. Sikonyela's followers realized that only Retief knew how to open the handcuffs and that the chief was entirely at his mercy. Eventually, Sikonyela pleaded for mercy and Retief agreed to unlock the handcuffs on condition that Dingana's 200 head of cattle be first dispatched to his crawl. The four trekkers arrived with the cattle at Dingana's crawl, and there things started happening that changed the course of the history of South Africa. Not all members of Piet Retief's party were four trekkers or Boers, or Dutch descent. There was one man among them who, stripped of all the dignity that one normally found in his fellow countrymen, operated as a spy for his people in the land of the Zulus. He was an Englishman named Halstead, and he was known to the Zulus as the Curious Peeper because of the way he normally went creeping around the crawls and gathering information about our customs and especially our weapons. Dingana's kraal was a vast structure consisting of two large concentric circles of stockades. The inner circle 
enclosed the great arena for social gatherings, meetings and dancing, and into which cattle could be driven for protection. In the space between the inner and the outer circles were hundreds of huts housing his warriors and their families. Attached to one side of the vast structure was the royal kraal in which all Dingana's wives and concubines were housed. This section was known as the Forbidden Place, and all Zulus knew that the death penalty was meted out without mercy on any male who ventured too close to this enclosure. It was Halstead's habit to ride his horse and approach this enclosure so that he could peer over the stockade. He did so frequently while Piet Retief and some of his followers went out to visit Sikonyel. The Zulus are a very suspicious and superstitious race. They could not understand why Halstead was so curious why he chanced to do a thing no Zulu would dare do. Dingana's concubines and daughters had strict orders not to venture outside their huts into the fierce sun, since a lighter skin color has always been looked upon as more glamorous than dark shades. They used to come out only at sunset, and especially in the moonlight. Under cover of darkness, Halstead could approach closer, and this was on the night before Petritif returned that he was caught in the act of putting his head over the stockade. On this occasion, one of Dingana's wives, who was a few months pregnant, had a nightmare and sought the refreshment of the cool night air. She saw the strange white face peering over the stockade and suddenly she felt all but refreshed. The news reached one of the high wives who approached Mkabai, Dingana's aunt, the following morning with a pot full of water which she emptied on the floor of the hut. She then placed the pot upside down in the middle of the floor. This is a recognized symbolic gesture to announce a miscarriage. Mkabai's evil mind and her strong love for Tingana promptly induced her to read a great deal into this whole incident. She approached Dingana and persuaded him to believe that the white men were at his kraal with evil intent and they were scheming to hit at his weak spot, his wives. Dingana was well and truly frightened. The more he thought about it, the more he panicked. When Peter Thief arrived, he said to him, Now, you have the land you want. Please go there and do with it what you want. Now you have your reward. But on second thoughts, he decided to hit while the iron is hot. He invited Petritif to stay and join him in a ceremonial feast. The feast lasted four whole days, and on the last day, Dingana called upon his crack regiments to stage a war dance. Petritif was very impressed by this display, and he laughed a great deal being as usual in an excellent mood. It was during this display that Dingana quietly slipped away. He had said to Redif, Now, O oh Litivu, you of the happy beard, now my children shall play for you. You will see how many warriors pound the cringing earth with their feet. Look upon my warriors. While all eyes were fixed on the dancers, Dingana stole away like a jackal. He went to a hillock overlooking the crawl, thoroughly convinced by then that the white men were wizards who had only come to bewitch him through an uncanny onslaught on his wives. When he reached the hillock, he gave the predetermined signal to my great-grandfather. He slowly raised his knobkiri and shouted, Kill the wizards! Kill the wizards! From beyond the stockades came the Kikiza cry from the women. There was only one man left outside the crawl to guard the horses, and when he heard 
amid the tumult he briskly fled for dear life. All history books contain the story he had to tell. Fifty guards seized Petredif and his men and held them down while they were systematically clubbed to death with Sikongwana tanning clubs. The other warriors went on dancing as if nothing was happening. Petredif was the last to die. He died no cringing coward. He fought back to the last inch of his breath. He never asked for mercy. Through long association with the tribes, he knew that this was useless. He never knew why he had to die. And until this day, few have known that by strict tribal laws and customs, these four trackers were all executed for an attempted offence against the high wives of a chief. Our storytellers have no pride in this tale. It takes great courage to tell it. It was only after this fateful event had been added to the role of history that our historians managed to piece the details together. On careful analysis and extensive inquiries, the facts emerged. The Zulus were so shocked about this mad action on the part of Dingana that many more, including some high Indunas, deserted him and went over to Mbande. For this rash act, Dingana and the Zulu tribe paid a ghastly price. Dingana was pursued, tortured and killed by his own people. The Zulu race bravely faced their punishment at the Battle of Blood River, the only battle in human history where more people were killed than there were shots fired. Ten thousand Zulu warriors laid down their lives in exchange for two slightly wounded fort trackers. And while with this battle, the Zulu race virtually disappeared from the scene, the losses of the four trackers have been annually commemorated for more than a century. And in these years, many more curious Africans than the number of men in Bid Radif's party have been shot dead, prosecuted and sentenced for prowling around and peering through the bedroom windows of white people. There was another white man in Dingana's kraal at the time of the massacre. His name was Owen. Dingana had approached him before this fatal day and had said to him, Why does this man, this wizard, prowl around my woman's place at night? It is said that you are a man of wisdom, O oh, Mawen. What shall I do about this man? To this, Owen replied, I shall speak to this man, Stindy, and he shall listen to my words. According to our historians, Owen never made any effort to speak to Halstead. Owen had every opportunity to warn Bidradif, but this he did not do either. On the fatal day, Owen was confined to his hut under a five-man guard and he witnessed everything that happened. Why has Owen kept silent about the whole incident? If Owen left any written records and if these are still preserved somewhere, they should be scrutinized with the greatest care.